One of the main themes of the Better Call Saul Breaking Bad universe is that seemingly insignificant, poor moral choices can spiral out of control. Superficially insignificant yet dire moral choices set forth a cascade of consequences. Characters like Walt, Jimmy, Kim, Nacho, and Jesse find themselves ensnared in one flaw or another that either blossoms out of control or becomes nipped at the bud. In life's grand symphony, we often worry about any multiplicity of things harming us, but more often than not, it's the same tenacious demon relentlessly pounding at the doors of our soul again and again and again. And if you let it in once, even for a second, it comes back again, stronger, each time with heightened consequences complemented by our ever more dire circumstance. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul make it clear that this is only possible because we let it lay hold of our soul all those times before. The characters all have something good that they could have done and sunk themselves into as opposed to getting into crime. But due to one flaw or another, they choose to be bad. The allure of greatness is always forsaken for the tempting embrace of a darker path. It's not a solitary descent into malevolence that shapes their fates, but rather repeated acceptance of small, seemingly insignificant bad choices that become a stepping stone to their doom. Bad choices that, in retrospect, could have easily been ignored. Jesse could have been a carpenter, Walt could have rejoined Grey Matter, Mike could have been an honest cop, Jimmy could have been an honest lawyer. But instead, they succumb to their fatal flaw, willingly consigning themselves to their own preferred method of self-destruction. I think Gilligan's view on religion helps inform us on this theme. Vince strongly believes that bad deeds ought to be properly punished. He's a strong advocate for no one getting away with the crimes that they commit. He said in a New York Times interview, I find atheism just as hard to get my head around as I find fundamental Christianity. Because if there's no such thing as cosmic justice, what's the point of being good? That's the one thing that no one has ever explained to me. Why shouldn't I rob a bank, especially if I'm smart enough to get away with it? What's stopping me? It's through this worldview that he forces all of his characters, at some point, to face some kind of cosmic justice for their crimes. He believes in, and thus implements a narrative framework, where the scales of the universe demand equilibrium. Each character must reckon with the repercussions of their actions. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul embody a philosophy that refuses to let wrongdoing slip through the fingers of accountability. Jimmy McGill's evolution to the ethically flexible Saul Goodman mirrors, in intriguing ways, the biblical narrative of Saul's conversion to Paul. In the Bible, Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus is a pivotal moment marked by a shift from persecutor to apostle. Conversely, in Better Call Saul, Jimmy's transformation into Saul Goodman can be viewed as a reversal of the Saul to Paul conversion. While Biblical Saul converts from Judaism to Christianity, and his name change reflects that, James in Better Call Saul seemingly gives up his Irish Christian identity to embrace the name Saul, which is a name synonymous with Judaism. So in both stories, Saul represents something bad. Only in the Gilligan universe, you become bad, but in the Biblical universe, you become good. One of them is becoming Saul, and the other one is moving away from him. Jimmy tends to see life not as a sequence of dominoes, but as a singular atomized event. He doesn't think about how what he's doing will impact his future. This mode of thought is put to context when we get a flashback from him in his youth. Jimmy learns from a young age that taking shortcuts and being dishonest is what wins. His father was constantly losing due to his honesty, but the scammers were winning because of their dishonesty. This leads Jimmy to a road of taking shortcuts and bending the rules when he gets older. It's due to the repeated events of his father getting scammed that Jimmy grows a disregard for the law and becomes a master of outsmarting the system. That very system his brother worships in such high esteem. Jimmy eventually scams Chuck, scams Howard, scams Kim on one occasion, and helps a bunch of criminals and guilty people. Even as Gene Takovic, he can't help but scam people. He can't stop even with a new identity and a blank slate. As time goes on, he continues to climb higher and higher in the legal and monetary world. However, the height of his climb is amplified by the impending descent once consequences catch up. You can move slowly in the right direction, or you can move speedily in the wrong direction and end up crashing and burning. We all make our choices. And those choices 
They put us on a road. Sometimes those choices seem small, but they put you on the road. You think about getting off, but eventually you're back on it. You do something small and it snowballs into something big and uncontrollable. This is how crime progresses. Stealing money from his family business led him to becoming the person he is later on. The more crimes you commit and get away with, the more you adapt to it. You get used to it. The repetition of committing and successfully navigating through crimes breeds adaptation and desensitization. The initial criminal deeds lay a foundation for the sense of comfort and normalization of the risk. Soon, major crimes don't seem all that risky anymore, even despite the stakes being considerably higher this time around. The moment you start on this road, it is nearly impossible to get out. Gene Takovic, from the moment he conned Marion, was set on a road where he was inevitably bound to get caught. Not necessarily of his own doing, mind you, but because of the relationships he had with other people. He and Jeff never got caught. They didn't spill anything to Marion. The way Jimmy was caught was by a chance occurrence. Marion just so happened to look him up, and from there, it was over. What's special about the Better Call Saul ending is that Jimmy, in a way, acknowledges that he can't actually escape from the inexorable pull of vice, and thus he willingly subjects himself to a life of prison. He could have accepted a seven-year jail time, finagling his way out of trouble in typical Saul Goodman fashion. But then what? He goes back on the street, does some more conning, and gets back in the same position where he has to finagle himself out of trouble against the feds? If being traumatized by Lalo, working with Walt, and even getting a new identity didn't stop him from doing that, what makes him think that a mere seven years in prison is really gonna do anything? It's all just a futile attempt. If he's back on the street, he'll find some way to get himself back to scamming and causing mayhem. It's utterly irresistible to him. He's an opportunist who feels as though he's not capable of backtracking. So he decides to take the full punishment, the full punishment that he frankly deserves. He confesses all of his crimes honestly and renounces the name Saul Goodman. And he makes sure everyone knows that his name is James McGill. This is one of the few times in the series he refers to himself not as the flamboyant name Saul Goodman, or even the familiar nickname Jimmy, but as his proper name, his proper legal name, James. A poignant testament to the recognition of the gravity of his culpability. A symbol for his genuine desire for this moment to be something different from all the others. If we think of James and Saul as being two separate entities hosting the same body, then being in prison forces him to keep this insatiable, ravenous, uncontrollable monster known as Saul Goodman contained. Jesus says if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. He's saying that whatever is causing you to not be at your best, you need to cut it off. In a way, James is doing the same. He's stopping that monster from wreaking havoc. By not allowing Saul the chance to spring up, he's allowing the good James part to take control. Jimmy had a lot of enemies, Lalo, Walt, Howard, etc. He managed to finagle his way out of all of them, but he was never able to defeat his worst one. But in that final episode, by confessing his sins, he paid the price he was finally due. But in return, he got rid of his worst enemy, himself. Imprisonment holds the unrestrained force of Saul Goodman at bay. Jimmy accepts the fact that he will never exercise this force, so he does the responsible thing and retains it as much as he can. I talked about this idea with Walt in a previous video of mine, so I'll try and keep this relatively short and only touch on the parts that I didn't talk about in that other video. There are many people who defend Walt's actions, calling them acts of self-defense, or at the very least, justified acts of self-preservation against immoral people. While you can go back and forth on what the right decision is, and Walt's moral culpability in them, something is undeniable. Walt's getting into the business to begin with, despite having many outs, is really where the moral wear and tear originates. Without taking that first step into the drug business, he wouldn't have had to deal with all those morally confusing issues. What no one can deny, however, is that Walt didn't need to kill Mike. That was, by his own admission, a senseless killing. But what exactly brought Walt to that point? This action can only be understood by looking at his journey up until this point. He was used to being put in, or having to carry out, 
morally ambiguous decisions before this. This action is the culmination of all the previous morally ambiguous decisions he had to make before this. All the times he had a gun to his face, or felt as though he had to kill someone, eroded his moral compass. It made him more comfortable with the idea of using force when someone even slightly spurns his fragile ego. And speaking of that ego and his pride, Walt had many opportunities to leave the drug business, with millions for his family to inherit, but he chose not to out of pride. Walt's problem is that he didn't just want to be good, he wanted to be better than everyone else. That's partly why he left Grey Matter. He didn't want to be one scientific genius among many. That's why he's a high school teacher, even when he's more than qualified to be a professor. Because if he were to leave to Grey Matter or become a professor, he would be among relative equals. In the drug business cooking meth, however, he would be the unparalleled best. And if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Gus was not only obsessed with revenge, but he wanted the most brutal and psychologically torturous revenge possible. After witnessing his friend die, Gus develops an all-consuming, fiery beef with Hector. Despite many opportunities to enact proportional justice, he refrains and engineers a form of punishment that will go beyond merely the physical. He could have let Mike or Nacho kill Hector, but in his own words, that fate would have been far too humane. He wants Hector left alive, but barely. Just enough to witness the destruction of his family and the crumbling of his empire, all while being completely powerless to stop it. He wanted Hector to live and know that Gus took down his entire family and that he was able to do nothing else but ring his bell in despair. While Gus didn't directly contribute to Tuco or the twins' death, he was directly responsible for Lalo's death. Lalo is the child Hector perhaps had the most fidelity towards due to him being the oldest and the highest up in the family hierarchy. Next to, of course, Hector himself. This is the implication anyways, as he carries the Dawn prefix unlike everyone else in the family, aside from Hector. Lalo narratively serves as a manifestation of Hector's hate for Gus, and contrasts him in some really cool ways. Lalo was larger than life despite having a low-key identity. Gus is a very public identity, but a very low-key personality. As opposed to most criminals in the series, Lalo and Gus possess qualities that could cast them as positive members of society. Lalo is charismatic and Gus can pull off being a hardworking chicken man. Gus has a very loud and bombastic death, a death that reverberates around the entire state, a spectacle witnessed by many, whereas Lalo has a very low-key death, only Gus saw it. Gus, who meticulously cultivated a public persona, meets a dramatic and public end, while Lalo, meticulously curated a private persona despite having a larger-than-life presence, exit the stage in a more subdued manner, witnessed only by his nemesis. Lalo has Don Eladio's personality, Gustavo's intelligence, the Salamanca twins' fearlessness, Tuco's psychopathic behavior, Hector's pure hatred, Mike's capabilities, Jimmy's personal skills, and Walt's unpredictability. But even with all that, as Kim astutely notices, he has no one to rely on. Sin is such a thing that leaves you isolated, or at the very least, not being able to trust anyone. Nacho betrays him, and everyone else he can rely on is too deep in the pit to be of any help. This isn't what does him in or anything, but it's interesting to note and reflects something poignant about the nature of sin. On that note, Lalo is perhaps the closest depiction of what I envisioned the devil might look like in human form. Charismatic, charming, and smooth-talking, yet harboring an unbelievable evil nature. In fact, he often uses these ostensibly endearing personality traits to magnify his pursuit of insidious ends. Behind that affable personality is a man who will kill and perhaps even manufacture people for his own gain. In possibly the most terrifying scene of the series, we are made privy to how Lalo killed Mateo and his mother. Upon surviving the assassination and entering their location, he asked Mateo to shave his beard, which, if you know anything about growing facial hair, I'd guess that it took him about a year of consistent growth to get there. Mateo, thankful to Lalo for all he's done in his life, immediately and joyfully does it. He trusted and loved Lalo for providing for him with his teeth, and possibly even his entire well-being. But the teeth were strategically labeled under Lalo's name, so after he shaves, Lalo has all the preparations needed to make a convincing body double. So he kills Mateo off-screen, incinerates his body, and throws that double into the crime scene, making it look like he was the one who was incinerated in the attack. 
The family trusted and even loved him. Mateo so swiftly and cheerfully shaved off his beard for no reason other than the fact that he likes Lalo and Lalo told him to do it. The man Mateo respected and loved so much viewed him, or perhaps even created him, to be a literal body to dispose of for his own gain. I don't think Lalo actually wanted to do this. He does actually lament some people's deaths. But it does show how truly low he was able to stoop for his own gain. This level of self-preserving brutality, magnified by his infectious charm, really highlights the cold wrath of Hector in a way that he couldn't do himself. And staying on that connection between Lalo and Hector, Lalo actually gave Hector his bell. So in a symbiotic way, Hector lives through Lalo, and Lalo lives through Hector. It was Lalo who provided the trigger for the Salamanca and Gus rivalry to reach an explosive end. Gus and the Salamanca's entire conflict was literally something that exploded. The conflict between them was more than a mere clash of personalities. It's a volatile mix of pent-up hatred and an insatiable thirst for revenge. Their animosity becomes a literal time bomb, a powder keg that was bound to explode given the mounting tensions and deep-seated vendettas. The rivalry wasn't a matter of if it would blow up, but rather a question of when. Their end was an inevitable eruption fueled by the combustible elements of hatred and retribution. Gus and the Salamanca story is a powerful reminder that a life spent seeking revenge is a suicide note written in the blood of your victims. Nacho has already treaded down the road Jimmy and Kim are just starting. He's already living that life of crime. Nacho's story is an unblinking reminder of just how much easier it is to get into the game than it is to get out. One bad move begets more until you have to continually make morally questionable actions in the name of some complex web of self-defense and self-preservation. And I use the word web there for a reason. Nacho's story reminds us that this web doesn't just involve you. It can entrap anything in your vicinity. It'll eventually entangle those around you. Your sins are not individual issues, but a pervasive curse that ensnares and entwines all of those around you. Walt was in it for the power, pride, and ego. We don't know why Nacho got into the game, but it's likely he just got into the wrong crowd while trying to make a little cash on the side. This is just my guess, as he doesn't really like doing a lot of this stuff. But even that, if done immorally, will become a voracious monster that you cannot stop. What makes Nacho stop is similar to what made Jesse want out. The drug life was impacting his personal life. Nacho worrying about his father's safety due to him being entangled with the drug business was not some unfortunate byproduct. Rather, it's a concomitant feature of being in the business. Don Eladio telling Nacho that if he wants to feel safe, that he should choose another line of work, wasn't just some cheeky joke. It was an honest assessment of what it means to be a criminal. It wasn't until it was too late that Nacho realized this and tried to make things right. He's like Jesse in that they both foolishly start down a terrible road, only to realize the innocent are compromised, but still end up being tugged around against their will by people more powerful than them. Nacho gets his first scar before the show begins. A part of someone's skull got stuck in his left shoulder. Later on in the show, in order to prove his loyalty to Gus, he had to get shot in his right shoulder which also left a scar. In order to heal himself, he had to take blood from one of the Salamancas. This symbolizes, in vivid detail, how Nacho was completely controlled by his adversaries and indelibly corrupt by them. His skin and his blood don't belong to him, symbolizing how his body and soul are taken away from him. He's molded by crime, literally having it run through his veins. He's a vessel for the criminal world, belonging to them and having no agency of his own. Ultimately, he was able to find some kind of peace, spilling out all his grievances and getting out on his own terms. He knew that if he went with the Salamancas, he would have likely died a slow and painful death for betraying Lalo. But simultaneously, he didn't want to continue being a puppet for Gus. So he strikes a deal with Mike and sacrifices himself. In a way, he nipped the source of horror at the bud. He was the source of his family's worry. And with him gone and no longer being manipulated around, he can ensure not only that he won't continue being used, but he can ensure that his family will be safe. All of this because he probably had many small, seemingly insignificant choices that were amplified, which ultimately dismantled his life. Jimmy told his monster that he's locking him in and not letting him leave. Walt let his monster destroy everything around him. Nacho told his that if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me.
Kim similarly is a victim of the corrosive and contagious elements of Vice. At the beginning of the series, she was a stand-up lawyer, even berating Jim for foregoing morality and actively wanting Jimmy to stop telling her about the scams he was doing. However, a shift occurs, and she grows to not only tolerate Jim's schemes, but actively encourages them, even joining in and relishing them. Enjoying them so much that she was willing to withdraw important information regarding Lalo. Eventually, the consequences of her lifestyle catch up to her, and she decides to leave New Mexico and settle in Florida. The once strong-willed woman finds herself running away from her ever-evolving identity, even if it means embracing a life that is markedly dull and passive. Through realizing who she was becoming, she was able to stop it and move on before it became worse. Relatively speaking, Jesse and Kim face the lightest consequences. Jesse gains freedom, escaping the confines of captivity, and Kim avoids imprisonment and death and can live a relatively normal life. But this isn't to say that they came out unscathed. Jesse dealt with the demise of two girlfriends, even witnessing one of them firsthand, and Kim undergoes a profound loss of personal fulfillment as she parts away with her first husband, Saul Goodman. According to C.S. Lewis, the gates of hell are locked on the inside. When talking about whether God sends us to hell or not, he says, It's not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing up which will of itself be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. Hell isn't an unfortunate byproduct of non-conscious behavior, but an active decision to continually choose bad and a conscious choice to reject good. Lewis didn't believe there was a third-party conscious entity, God, that actually sent us to hell. Rather, we chose hell as a natural consequence of rejecting him. When you choose to supplant the ultimate good for something else, that thing consumes you and locks you in hell. Even if that thing is good like wanting to feel fulfilled with your job, if it's done in a poor way, it will consume you and become your hell. And in this hell, you are consumed by a fire that spreads and grows. Maybe you're a bit more prideful than you should be. Maybe you're a bit more vengeful than you should be. If it is not nipped at its source, it can consume you like a fire if left unchecked. This is not at all dissimilar to how crime is depicted in the Better Call Saul Breaking Bad universe. You choose bad once in perhaps a seemingly insignificant moment, and it ends up changing your life, spiraling it out of control. Walt felt emasculated before and wanted money, respect, and power. Mike just had one bribe change the course of his life. Nacho, Mike, and Walt were all too late once they tried leaving. The Salamancas and Gus killed themselves, and Saul forced himself to stay caged in order to contain who he knew he was. The universe weaves a compelling tapestry of morality and consequence. The characters serve as cautionary tales of the profound impact of choices. Will you choose good? Will you choose the ultimate good? Or will you choose to follow imperfection and fan the flame of your lower inclinations? Will you seek redemption while you still can? Or will you burn in passion? In this cosmic network, the choice is ours to make. Redemption beckons those willing to heed its call. But not all of us will. As we stand at the crossroads of morality, we are given two doors, one that leads to life and the other that leads to death. The cosmic powers of justice stand above us and challenge us to define our destiny, asking us to ponder whether we will seek redemption or willingly traverse a path ablaze with the consequences of our choices. I decided to edit this video much more rigorously than I do my other videos. Let me know what you guys think, this took a very long time to make. You can look into my Fiverr account down below where I may edit your own video. Get in now before I rapidly increase the price. Thanks for watching.